My friends, uh, in the meantime, I'm glad that you all tuned in, and we appreciate each and every one of you. Um, we want to present our phone guest in just a few minutes. Um, first of all, uh, her book is out now. It was pressed. Uh, it was the first printing this year. The Pizan Hall Press. Uh, it was printed on all recycled paper, which is awesome. The book is called Reflection. Nearly 500 pages. Uh, it is an awesome book available at Barnes & Noble online, Walmart online, Amazon, if you're looking for the book. Uh, I would like to introduce my guest. We're going to do this a little differently than normal, so have a little patience with me, folks. Uh, Lynette, are you, can you hear us okay? Yes. Awesome. I think I can hear you pretty good, too. Uh, so you're in the upstate New York area, I take it. Right. Awesome. We were just discussing the weather up there and how it's similar to where I'm from in Illinois, uh, about snow and all that good stuff. Thanks for um, coming on the show tonight. Thank you. Yeah, I really appreciate you taking the time. Um, well, you know how time is. I do. It's very fleeting. You want to invest it where it's due. Exactly, yeah. It's Our time is so valuable. That's the thing. It's like money to me, you know? Money's not valuable, but time is. Um, we were talking about your new book, and um, the cover design was by yourself and Red Wolf. First of all, the cover's awesome. I really enjoyed it. It's kind of like eye candy. Uh, nice, pleasing colors. Uh, and then the book itself, you spent like 40 years with the concept in mind. Is that correct? Not just the concept. People have asked me, how is it that I remembered everything? And it's not that I remembered. I started the book in 1970. And wow. uh, as a matter of fact, a resident of Oregon, uh, Kathy, I think she was still a Barton or a Gillies, <laughs> you know how people's names change, but yes. she and I started it in a rented, rundown hotel room in Los Angeles, and uh, kind of life got in the way. We we were attending trials in Los Angeles, and so through the years. I wrote down notes, lots of notes, and I put some of them together. I wrote a lot of stories, and and uh, at the time, I didn't know how to assemble them, but pretty soon, it came to me that this is not a book that was written for anyone else, but it was written for people like me, who enjoy... A historical trip through both age and experience. And uh, there was so much written about our cases that was false and uh, confused. And I wasn't able to respond to it in a timely way because nobody wants to hear that didn't happen. Yeah. Nobody wants to hear this isn't true or any, you know, any kind of protest. So I decided to write what was true. And that's according to me, and you my know, personal experience. And you know, Lynn, I remember you telling me that you had talked to some major book publishers and you said one of them even told you that you would actually sell more if you were to lie. Is that true? Oh, absolutely. Uh, in fact, every um, buddy that I talked to who had written a book uh, gave the excuse that the publisher or the editors wanted uh, more sex. In, and it was distorted sex. I mean, the things that were written about Charlie were were not true. And, um, but it was what, they said it was what people wanted to read. I didn't want anything to do with those people who capitulated, and I didn't want a major publisher to do this book because I understood that that was part of their agenda. 
Yeah, completely. So, I have a small publisher. There are people that I know and uh, I trust. And we put it together. Uh, well, it was done in a hurry, the, the um, last of it, because my publisher said that they wanted it now and that they weren't willing to wait longer. Uh, my own take on it was that I wrote from the heart what I experienced and I wanted to leave it behind. I'm uh, almost 70. I'm going to be 70 in a couple of weeks. Uh, it's not ancient, but you you feel and understand the um, process of getting older and you understand how vulnerable uh, you are and you understand mortality much more as you get older. It's not something young people want to hear about, but... <laughs> Uh, I, and it also is pretty much a trip, the whole thing. <laughs> it is. They, but, they say youth, know, is, youth you know. is wasted on the young. <laughs> and you're right, the young people don't want to hear about it. I was just telling someone young today that certain things come with age, with wisdom, you know, wisdom is different from intelligence, and, um... As we grow older, we come to a more clear realization that life is fleeting, and uh, we think about those things, and that's what comes with, I guess, growing older. It does, and I don't, you know, the 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 pitfalls teach you that you have to use it, meaning the body, you have to use it or lose it, <laughs> and uh, so you make your choices. And you do the best for yourself that you can. And uh, on the way, you enjoy as much of the of life as you can. So, um, well, you know, but, but I'm saying I wanted to leave this behind. So much has been said about us that was false. And I thought, I was so naive, I thought, that if the man in the tweed suit and the British accent was telling us something about his publication and that and his intentions, that it was that it was going to be true, and you know it was silly because, the, for example, the first person who published a story that I gave him, he changed all of the references to children to drugs. Oh, and I was quoting the Beatles saying, they will take us back where we came from. And uh, he said that was drugs. So, um, wow. That's, that's a pretty big stretch there. <laughs> it's a big stretch. So these things were were uh, awesome and not in a good way. Uh, and w at the time, we had no way to counter them. Yeah. So I all I could do was take notes. Well, and and then I. We're grateful really that you did, <laughs> because the book, okay. I mean, at least that way, it's it sets your, sets kind of put your story out there, and um, you know, can maybe set some things straight for some people. Well, you know, in one way, I hope so. In another, somebody who has the sensibilities, somebody who has and in the intelligence or the same kind that I do. Everybody's got different types of intelligence. Uh, but, you know, they may understand it and uh, grasp it in a different way than the general public as we know it, yeah. you know. Well, we yeah. all perceive things in different ways. I guess, you know, truth can be something different to everyone, but, you know what I mean, they always say there's three sides to every story. You know, so I think it's important that, um, you know, that we still have the freedom to be able to do things like write books and have community radio sure. so that we can get, you know, 
get all the points of view out there because gosh knows in the media, mainstream media, we are usually given basically the same story by all of them. You know, I was wondering if they didn't just recycle stories from the past. Well, it seems that way because sometimes. It, it does. Kind of like the the book 1984. When you read that book, that's what that guy's job was to like continually shred the past and recycle and make up the future as he went. It was just re- kind of like how society has become, man, you know? Exactly. So whatever it is that they're pushing at the time, uh, that's what we get. Uh, some of it is interesting. Some of I, I watch the news. I just, you know, every night I watch the nightly news. Uh, every once in a while I watch other news. I see what people are interested in. It's not my uh, preference in most cases. Uh, I, I don't. I don't have a. I don't have a penchant for disaster and murder and and all of that. But I understand that that's uh, thrilling and frightening, and that fear and thrills uh, attach themselves some way in some psychology in some people's minds and and that's what they're looking for yeah therefore it sells you know just um just like in the movies i mean sex sells and they throw things in you know you can watch a so-called biopic and it's uh like well how much of this is you know true biography and you know how much of this is made up and uh you know sex sells so that's what they push is the the negative stuff the sex the violence and that kind of thing. Right. Right. Or whatever, whatever. Sex to me is expression and uh, whatever type of expression that they see in sexual content, sexual contact uh, is, some of it is bizarre to me, but it's whatever it is, is what people want or what they're curious about. So, uh, yeah, it's a big machine. Now, what surprised me was going online. I haven't been allowed to go online, but um, my friend here has a, like an iPhone, and I I was just, I would tap in things. I want to know the origin of a word or an expression, I, some simple thing, and all these other things were popping up. At first, I didn't know how to negotiate through all of that. I'm, I'm getting it down, but I, I think it's just a minefield. I think it's terrible how it's been allowed to be used for that kind of uh, commercial fail. I, I, yeah, I and uh, it, the the internet is a, uh, it's a rabbit hole, <laughs> if you will. I, you, you know, there's so much, um, it could be used for so much good, there's so much information, but at the same time, as we learned through our, you know, election process that made the news, um, it, it's also used for a lot of misinformation, unfortunately. Right. The, the, the sales is what bothers me the most. I, I don't automatically accept other people's opinions about politics or anything else. And I know that the main concern is the condition of our water, the ocean, the air, things that are primary to our survival. Things that matter. And the survival of the next generations. But... Um, I must do a legal ID real quick. Sorry to interrupt. I really apologize. Uh, you are listening to KSKQ 89.5 FM, Ashland, Oregon, and KSKQ translator K231CW 94.1 FM, Medford, Oregon. We are talking with author Lynette Fromey. Thanks again for being here, Lynette, and sorry to interrupt. 
And thank you for pronouncing my name right. <laughs> you know, I never hear anybody say your name right, and it is Fromy, like foam with an R and me, right? Exactly. Cool. What, what type of name is that, by the way? What is... It is German. It's a German. And I thought so, but I wasn't, I wasn't positive. I wanted to ask. It is German, and uh, I think the original meaning had to do with pious, which uh, then became a sense of uh, arrogance. And, you know, it, the word pious used to mean uh, devout. Okay. religious, yes, yes. that kind of thing. And then it became something else. I like the origins because you can see how words change throughout history and then you get an idea of what the, uh, you know, the politics were at the time, what the, how people evolved like that. Yeah, it's absolutely. It's just interesting to me. You know, I was thinking the other day, and I want to talk more about your book, of course. One thing I was uh, pondering when thinking about you, one thing that you for sure are, and, you know, a lot of people try to project, you know, so many things onto you and projecting so much that's not even true, and, and I'm sure you're used to that, but one thing that you are is misunderstood. That's what I think you are. You're misunderstood so much. Like, so many people seem to see you through the eyes of their own ignorance to me. And then they build a story or a book or movie based on that, how they see that through their eyes, which is ignorance, in the name of money. And so, yeah, to me, you're just one of the most misunderstood uh, figures in history that I know of. Well, I think a lot of that stems from, like we said, like the media. Um, you know, that's kind of the, the one-sided story that that um, is pushed upon people. So, yeah. Um, but yes, misunderstood for sure. Yeah, well, you know, like I said, there was no way to correct that. Now, even online, we could have, like if, if the Internet had been present at the time we were being uh, talked about, we could have said some things online, but... Uh, this is something where people have grasped an idea of the world, let's say, and the people in it. And they have uh, ideas about anybody, including all the celebrities, all the people you hear about. I even catch myself saying, gee, I wonder if that's true. Uh, that's an important question. Gee, I wonder if that's true. If it's important to you, you know, it's it's worth uh, checking out. Is it true? Not true? Is it important what other people are thinking and doing? Are you living your life through a celebrity? Mm -hmm. Are you hoping your life will evolve and become, you know, like somebody else? Or are you taking your moments as they come and appreciating your gifts and the things that you you have and, uh, you know, making the most of them. And are you looking at the, at the future? Are you looking? There's a certain responsibility we have. I be, Living in the moment is and was always a luxury to the people I knew, we we were able to unburden ourselves from a lot of the past and live as we took in the moment and we were able to see the burdens of other people, but uh, there is a responsibility, you know, do we, can we write it off, can we uh, dance along and, and be happy and uh, forget about any kind of responsibility of all. Of course not, you know. There's the next generation. Yes. Well, and I, what, are they, what are they getting? Yeah, and I think you make a good point that, um, you know, if you care enough to find out what the truth is about something... I think people are often afraid of that because with the truth comes responsibility. And with responsibility comes, uh, you know, you either act 
act on that or you don't act. And if you, uh, there's some cognitive dissonance, I think, that happens with people because they don't want to know the truth because they know with the truth comes action or, or not doing something about it. And, uh, exactly. you know, they feel yeah. uh, maybe guilt or cognitive dissonance. I don't know, something that, that causes them I mean, to not doing act. doing something may not be the key. It may be a deep understanding of the world in its current condition and knowing that whatever change has to come is a result of the past, what's been done, what people are thinking, what people are eating and consuming and throwing away. Yes. And... You know, so um, it's a responsibility that carries weight, and it's not comfortable. But at the same time, uh, it gives you that sense of of uh, being a real human. You know, as a real human, we care about these things. We 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 respond to them. We talk about them when they're brought up. I want something that you can use to carry things that is not a plastic bag. Right. <laughs> uh, right. I, I, you know, I want something that will uh, recycle. I want everything that we use to be able to be recycled because we don't get more of it and, we, and the ocean, you know, I feel like as a um, as a feeling person, I understand the ocean has done all these great things for us. It absorbs the vibrations of the world. Yeah. It also and we made also, it our personal garbage dump, pretty much. Exactly. It's a shame. It so is. exactly. So I I want that to be recognized and I I want us I know the kids are working on it I know young people who realize this are saying what the heck we need uh, an ocean that functions as it was designed to amen that it that it uh, that it takes away the pollutants and it gives us the the food and the all the things that we need, we need the air to be able to handle and circulate and dissolve all the pollutants that we put in it. No, I, I mean, politically, when I think of politics, that's the last thing that's important to me. That's people. People are the least important because people need to understand that without the earth, there's nowhere to stand. There's nowhere to receive a, a, a good life. doesn't matter how much you get, how much money you make. It's going to be a real tough time if we don't take care of the land and the water and the air. Well, it's like so many Native American tribes remind us that uh, water is life, and you can't uh, drink oil. And, um, exactly. you know, <laughs> uh, we've learned a lot about that in the past couple of years with the so much, um, here where we live, there's a lot of activism going on with regards to, uh, you know, oil pipelines, uh, wanting to run them underneath the rivers and um, export or import or whatever it is they want to do at that moment, but uh, water is life, and uh, if we don't quit messing around with it, we're going to be in a lot of trouble very soon. I'm afraid. Right. No, you're you're absolutely right. So on one hand, we've got this burden to deal with. On the other hand, we have an attitude of appreciation for the things that we have and for these unbelievably beautiful creatures that are on earth the everything from these 
interesting birds and and uh, well everything the insects everything what we're going to be dealing with is the microbes the very tiny uh, or invisible things like viruses and so forth and it's our own doing but um, I believe it can be seen and understood and taken care of as long as it's not treated as another uh, problem for pharmaceutical companies to assuage. Yeah. As long as we're not offered more um, medicines and other things that they can sell us. Yeah, exactly. To to take care of it. We want to take care of it on the ground level. We want to take care of it uh, by having some respect for how the earth works. And because it's amazing, you it know. Is, it is. And taking our medicine from the earth, especially the cannabis plant. It's all the leading uh, research in Israel is showing that it not only fights cancer, but it can beat cancer. And they don't want that known here in the States because it, it will stop funding big pharma at that point. And then, then by God, they might cure the opiate addiction that they also fund. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> funny how that works. That's funny how that, that works. <laughs> Um, if you're just, yep, if you're just, exactly. if you're just now too- back in the seventies or back in the the sixties, uh, we had seen this stuff, we had seen the damage, but everybody had, and we were, we thought there was going to be an upheaval, and that people were going to say, okay, that's enough, that's enough. Uh, you try. You tried. The people of all races were upset. They knew these things, and they were also concerned about the way that they were being treated as people. So, I mean, the the different races of people were felt shortchanged somehow. The manufacturers and the people who put out thought uh, grabbed these people, convinced them to be spokespersons, and then you had the Forest Defense League or whatever that is. Uh, I, you know, and I would find out. I would look into a. A group, and I'd find out it was funded by the the lumber companies. Wow! And then I'd look into another group and find out it was funded by, you know, big pharmaceuticals. Exactly. So, the, so many of the studies that yeah. you read are are you know published or paid for by people like that who have an ulterior motive. Right. Right. If you're just tuning in, we well, are. One, one second, please. We are li- talking yeah. with Lynette Fromey right now. Her new book is called Reflection. You are listening to KSKQ. Uh, Ashlyn Medford, Oregon, thanks for being here. Again, it's Lynette Fromey. The book is Reflection, uh, available at Barnes & Noble online, Walmart online, Amazon. And yes, KSKQ recognizes the nonprofit community support of the Klamath Siskiyou Wildland Center. As a voice for wild nature, K.S. Wild's mission is focused on protecting public lands in the klamath Siskiyou region of southwest Oregon and northwest California. Community support for K.S. Wild helps ensure a legacy of wild rivers, ancient forests, and biodiversity. Learn more about K.S. Wild's wildlife and forest conservation programs and efforts to restore public lands at www.kswild.org. KSKQ thanks KS Wild and listeners like you for supporting community radio. Thank you, Sister Tracy. Uh, we are joined by Lynette Fromey. Uh, happy to have her here with her new book, Reflection. It's a really good book. It's really a positive book, uh, reflecting on the years 1967 through 1969. And it really put me in a good spot. When I was reading it, uh, it was relaxing. It 
There was a lot of moments where I was just surprised at the good energy that you were able to express through this book. So good job. I mean, it was really nice. Thank you. Well, it, it's it's memory. It's a really a luxury to go back there because uh, it was a time of people opening up and having so few judgments about each other that we could focus on other things. And and I know for myself that it it allowed me to. Uh, get off of myself. I was so critical of myself and everything about me. And I subsequently met young women who, they were beautiful, and but something was always wrong with them, according to them. Uh, so I really felt like we had been boxed into some kind of a, uh, negative programming and yes. I wanted to I wanted to see all of us as energetic uh, elves more or less for the the uh, helpfulness to any where we were where we used to go we would try to make it better than wherever, whatever it was when we got there. We, uh, we would, uh, any, any environment, we would clean it up and, uh, fix up the buildings and it was, it was a lot of fun. And I think most people were having a lot of fun at that time. You, you live in an area that is so, Progressed, progressive. I don't know if it's progressive. That has connotations now, uh, meaning political connotations. Uh, but I didn't see politics there. I saw people who had energy and a place to put it, hmm. and they were making everywhere they went better than it was when they got there. Yeah, people yes. and action so, can be a beautiful thing when that action is, uh, you know, in, in the right direction. People in action. Right. And, you know, uh, Wavy Gravy has been on the show many times, and he would tell us that, that when his group, the Hog Farm, used to travel around, if they got a flat tire, he would have a lemonade stand or something, you know. He would always make the best out of every negative situation. And it was I know. <laughs> I know. I heard that about him. I never met him. I met some of the people that were at the Hog Farm, but just briefly, uh, but I had heard about him that the police would stop them and he would engage them in different conversations and their minds were probably blown. These are people who who have transcended so much of the negativity in the world that they, they uh, managed to imbue upon whoever comes in front of them a, a positive outlook. Have you had a chance to see the Wavy Gravy film called Saint Misbehaven? No. Yeah, it came out a couple of years ago, and it's really uh, a 10 on a scale of 1 to 10. Just a fantastic film. Again, Saint Misbehaven. You would really like it. It's about his entire story with direct footage from India, uh, and it's great. I'll keep it in mind. I was wondering why people had to go overseas to India, for example, to uh, deal with what was going on here I, and why the, the Hindus were coming over here. Well, I guess they were invited. I think my, uh, we didn't have any God consciousness here. We had money, but they had God consciousness there, and they had faith, and we had none. So uh, the, some of the white folks... <laughs> Like Bhagavan Das was one of the first people in, uh, to actually 
go there. And when the Babas and the Hindalayas and the folks in Tibet, the Buddhists up there, they had never even seen a white man until Bhagavan Das came, you know, stumbling, looking for something higher frequency. And um, I think it's because they had faith there and, and God. And then a lot of the folks there saw that we had cars and, you know, houses and air conditioning, things like that. And they wanted that. So it's... It's strange, but the Western... There was an exchange, exactly. Yeah. Uh, I just wonder, are they are the people that uh, partook of that exchange in India and, and those places, are they better off now? Are the people in Africa better off? Have they, have they made a transition into uh, the kind of life that we have here, or... Has there been difficulty about that? Good question. And I think, uh, you know, maybe progress sometimes is means different things at different times to different people. Because I don't know if uh, if maybe, you know, technology and, and the things you just mentioned, like cars and, uh, you know, those sorts of things, if that's really considered, you know, progressing. Um, as far as, I think, the United States... Uh, receiving that, you know, those wisdoms from India, uh, places like that, that Bhagavan Das and Ram Das and people like that are responsible to bringing here. I'd like to think that that uh, we are better off for that. I think we might have gotten right. the, the better end of that deal as, as far as that goes. Right. No, but that's what I wonder. You know, dude, was there an even exchange there? Uh, are we are we now in touch with the people all over the world with these well, changes? Do we know how they're dealing, and do they have to go through the same changes that we went through with acquiring, and then all of a sudden realizing that we had much more than we ever needed? That kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. I don't I I don't know if they have to go through all that and if they do I hope it happens you know more rapidly than it happened with us. Yeah, I think we're I feel like uh somehow or another we're reaching our apex our our uh I don't know about apex is the right word but we're reaching a point where we're realizing here that uh you know and it's a good thing that materialism and Perhaps, you know, capitalism isn't all it's cut out to be. <laughs> a certain amount. I mean... Right, a certain amount. We, uh, but, but I'm not so sure we haven't is reached there that a point. Balance? I mean, the balance is what the key is. Uh, Charlie always had a nice balance. He, um, he saw what was, you know, beneficial and then what made us weak. Uh, what made him weak. Uh, so, whereas flush toilets were a nice thing, you know, what are we, what's the payment on the other side of that? How much, how much do we need to do or not do in order to keep that balance? I like that. Yeah. So, what, you know, it's, it's such a, um, it's a, it's a personal preference. You know, people in this country are, I feel like people in this country are really spoiled. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And, yes. And, you know, because I know I am. I can judge by, uh, you know, being somewhat soft and expecting to have help with things, expecting... Uh, more sometimes than is is uh, necessary. Have and and we have we have unlimited quantities. You know, you can go to the market and get anything from any part of the world now. So, you know, while people think that's wonderful, is it is it based upon what is good for other people? Is it really good for us 
the this ordering from other uh, ordering from the market and having something delivered to you that's what they do up a lot up here you you now have things I don't but you you can have things delivered to you your food everything everything you can have somebody shop for you <laughs> now all the trucks and vehicles that are bringing these things are using the gas and the oil and I and they're on the roads clogging up the roads I, I just wonder is that really good for us well yeah and the things that we lose in the process of those things uh, like you said at what cost is it a fair trade I know so many young people today um, as knowledgeable as they are about a lot of things you know the internet and uh, but a lot of things that they're losing in the process of depending on technology. Uh, right. You know, uh, even the ability to interact with a human being one-on-one uh, is compromised, I think, because of texting and uh, cell phones. Yeah, but of course, they, they don't want to hear it. But oh, no. no. Where, you, where you guys have a very... Uh, wonderful forum is besides having people talk about things on your show you have the music and kids always are attracted to music I know I wondered what happened to MTV I I had seen in when I was in prison I saw videos I saw Paul McCartney video I saw just a different videos and I loved the music and the videos completely attracted me uh, even the ones that I thought were peculiar or didn't give <laughs> yes. a, a positive message some of them you know that take you uh, into depression or suicide or whatever it is you know I thought well uh, at least they are putting out the music that people are listening to. Yeah. Uh, but then I tried to get it here, and I couldn't it's totally find changed. it. Yeah. I, you know, I remember back in 19, either 87 or 89, I had asked you what your what bands you liked, and you said you liked the band Great White. Well, we had a friend in prison whose brother was in Great White. Ah. And uh, that's probably why I said that. They were the... I, I mean, I... I have only heard one of their songs. Well, they were the first uh, first band I've ever interviewed on the radio in my career was Great White. They came in and played live on my show. Oh, that's that's great. Yeah, and, and and of course I was aware of the really terrible fire in Rhode Island. Uh, oh, yeah, sad. Tragedy. That was really sad. I had a friend who was involved in that. I have possibly a uh, memory uh, from another time in history where I was in a fire because Ooh. anytime I'm in a place where there are crowds of people, the first thing I do is I see where I would go if I needed to get out. Yeah. So, Could very so well be. I can't even... Yeah, it's one of those things that's, that's just... It's not quite haunting, but it's uh, a necessity for me. Yeah, I have, uh, I have a thing like that about water and drowning, so I, I often wonder the same thing, if maybe I have oh, uh, yeah, yeah. some fear now, left Deepak over. Now, Deepak Chopra says that anything you're afraid of is something you already went through. Yeah. I don't know, I don't know uh, you know, what the... I haven't thought through that a lot, but... Um, there are so many people that have come to understandings that are valuable to the rest of us. And I just, I just enjoy uh, looking at these different uh, sayings and things. For, I haven't read people's books. But I, I do like that. I read Siddhartha when I was on this road trip with Charlie and uh, Mary and some of us, and uh, it it was.
was an eye opener. It was uh, something that set me back, made me understand that there's so much more to the world than I was looking at. And that's what I wanted. I knew there was more to it. I, my parents were, were just trudging through life. And yeah. I thought, it can't be, it can't be like this. No, this can't be all there is. <laughs> there's magic in the world. There's love in the world. There's interesting things to find out. And you know... So, yeah. You know, Ram Dass, he says, if we're silent long enough that everyone's the guru or the teacher. Yeah. No, yeah, I believe that. I do believe that. So, uh, you know, I'm, I will probably end up doing some reading, and as I get older, I, I would love to sit on a porch and watch birds and so forth and and have some cannabis when I don't feel like I'm going to be tested to find out if I've been, if I've engaged in, in, you know, this illicit behavior. Back then even, it was like we weren't doing anything wrong. Yeah. For the longest time, we were not doing anything wrong, but everybody was an outlaw. Everybody who, who used marijuana was an outlaw. And, you know, we so slowly are seeing that change. I think that's starting to come about, but it sure does seem to be taking, you know, uh, politics get, again, politics, different politicians get in and things change. But, uh, you know, I think some of the states are starting to act on their own, and hopefully the propaganda and misinformation about cannabis is slowly leaving us with, you know, a yeah. uh, greater knowledge and understanding of the true research about it uh, as that comes to light, hopefully. About that and so many... So many things. Uh, so many things that are in nature that we can use to our benefit. So many ways in nature that we can watch and take lessons from so that we can benefit from them instead of trying to kill it all. Yes. Amen. It is, it is just, uh, you know, it brings me to tears a lot of times to understand that people are so afraid of nature that they want to destroy it. And uh, I pointed out, I put a point out some things in the book I wanted to be true to the times and uh, not put too much of my understandings now in in those times. So I I kept it brief, but I hope that it can be seen along the way on this. Yeah, well said. I need to say thank you to my sponsor. Uh, Diana's Records in Ashland, Oregon, is proud to support KSKQ Community Radio. Diana's Records, formerly CD or not CD, has been located in Ashland since 1986. Diana's offers a selection of new and used LPs, CDs and cassettes, and music and movies on DVD. You'll also discover an array of rock, math, and science t-shirts, record players, posters, mugs, and much more. Diana's Records is open seven days a week at 343 East Main Street in downtown Ashland. For more info, call 541-488-0066. KSKQ thanks Diana's Records and listeners like you for supporting community radio. I am Reverend Moody with Sister Tracy and our guest Lynette Fromey discussing life and her new book, Reflection. And Lynette, a couple people had sent me emails uh, recently here asking a couple of questions. I wonder if I could ask you. Sure. One of them is we were talking about the hog farm earlier, and I, they were, somebody wanted to know if you ever had any contact with the people from the Source family on Sunset Boulevard back in the day. It, it, no. Uh, it's not familiar. If the people, Father if Yod. we ran into the people, it would have been, uh, and I, 
unattached to that name. Okay. And the other one was, someone said, have you ever, did you ever meet the Lyman family, Mel Lyman? I did. You did? Okay. I did meet the, the Lyman family. I never met Mel Lyman. I think he was in Massachusetts or somewhere like that. But I did. Yeah, interesting. I saw that he was on the cover of Rolling Stone back in the day. Mel Lyman. Well, it was an interesting group. Uh, pretty intense. Uh, I don't want to get into it right now, but... Yeah. Yes, I, I did meet them. Okay. Um, and um, I don't know what happened to all of them. I heard that one of the men who was in... Uh, the movie The Brisky Point. He was a star of that movie. He, I heard that he went to prison and was found dead uh, under a barbell. Whoa. Uh, I do not know if that's true. I don't know if they got him out. Uh, you know, you wonder. But no, I didn't know them well. Okay. But I, I met them. What's, what is... uh, one thing I wanted to say was sure. that there is a picture of Manson uh, where he looks wild-eyed, and that's what you look like in the picture you sent me of you, Derek. <laughs> ah. Uh, and I, I wanted to tell you that that picture was taken in a police station in Ventura, California, and it was after <laughs> it was after we had been rousted out of the woods <laughs> uh, and told we were trespassing when there were no signs. We had taken a bus into the woods, and the police came, a lot of them, and we were sitting on the dirt in front of the police cars, there were about four of them, and they were uh, going through our IDs, and we were petting their dogs, and they got a little bit mad about that. Oh, I bet. You know, they, they said, heal, and the dogs, you know, right away, they went to the, to the guys, but... Um, Weren't you tripping? That, that arrest, it was, it only lasted overnight. We were released the next day, but that arrest resulted in some people taking uh, a small handful of acid because uh, nobody wanted to be picked up with it. And uh, his and that picture came out of that. To me, it's funny. Right, because, right. <laughs> like everywhere at the same time. But uh, it, you know, is shown as the Svengali that, you know, hypnotized all these people. <laughs> yeah. um, let me see what else. The brainwashed do not know they are brainwashed. <laughs> right. Well, that's what they say. Who knows? Right. <laughs> you know, I feel like we were brainwashed before. Uh, it was through the... Through nobody's fault. Uh, our parents thought that they, they didn't know they were brainwashed. Nope. A lot of them, you know, they were so, they had the opportunity to see different things, but they were so focused on making money and making it in the world that they couldn't see all the things that their kids were seeing. And we were saying like, whoa, we don't want to be like you. And we had that, uh, just that juicy, vibrant energy of kids that wants to discover the world that we have. And they felt that they had enough of the world because they had just been through two world wars you know what i mean yes and and, so they, and it, they and they had no blueprint when they became parents no one gave anybody like an instruction manual like here's how you raise this kid healthily you know so everyone kind of worked with what they had man you know really 
Exactly. So we realized that they didn't know, but at the same time, we couldn't hang back with them. We had to keep going. Sure. And I think my father, who never w would speak to me afterward, uh, or even before he didn't speak to me very much, but I think that he secretly admired me for going out and doing things that he didn't have the, you know, the he just couldn't do himself because he was so busy trying to make it in the world of, uh, yeah, you know, the American, of, dr American uh, dream, yeah. success for his parents. Yeah. Now there was one other thing I wanted to tell you, and I'm, I have to remember what it is. Um, gosh. I hope you remember. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'm well, intrigued it's, now. <laughs> you're teasing it's, me. It's not that important, I guess. Uh, it's uh, just about misconception. Oh, okay. Um, but whatever it is, I, I don't have it with me. Maybe it'll second. come to you. Now, I want to ask you this. Are you are you okay to keep talking, or do you want to wrap this up? I don't want to keep you longer than you want to talk to me. And You know what I mean? I want it to be comfortable. Well, the same for me. Yeah. I don't want to talk and talk and talk <laughs> for longer than you want to well, you'd have me Well, you'd certainly be welcome on this show anytime, uh, anytime you'd like. And, of course, I have another hour and 15 minutes, so there's no pressure or, or anything. But I... I wanted to ask what no, you... No, play some music. Play some music for them. Oh, there is one thing that comes to mind right away. Led Zeppelin. Huh. Uh, Jimmy Page. There's a story that circulated, and when I looked myself up on Wikipedia to see just exactly what was out there, a lot of it is wrong, but this one thing, I thought, who the heck is this? Some woman apparently approached Led Zeppelin in the 70s, I guess. Yeah. And and uh, was trying to warn them that something yes. dire was happening. No. I mean, it, this uh, road manager maybe uh, says that it happened. It was in a Led Zeppelin book. These things, that didn't happen with me. Wow. I, I wasn't that person. Ah. Uh, the same thing occurred with uh, Mike Love of the Beach Boys put out a book. I think partly it was the editors who suggested that it was me. Uh, like what they, maybe, maybe the person, maybe Mike Love said someone came to him in a shower and wanted to get in the shower with him. Uh, not me. Uh, it was, I don't even remember. Mike Love and Dennis Wilson were not close friends. They didn't, I think there was some animosity there. There, uh, I, I didn't. We didn't see him at all. Interesting. I had heard so, about I had heard about that tension between those guys. You know. Well, I don't know anything about it. All I know is that wasn't me, and he said it. You know that I came to his shower, and <laughs> then uh, you know these things are said. I think what it is is a person will say. Um, these two women did such and such. And then the editor will say, well, it could have been, you know. Yeah. It could have, because my name was out there. I had uh, approached the president. And, uh, it, you know, they figure, eh, it doesn't matter. Uh, well, to me, it mattered. Well, because sure. Because it wasn't me, and, you know. So anyway, I just wanted to mention that. Do you still have uh, Do you still have the red robe? What's that? Do you still have your red robe? Oh no. Gone. No, those the robes. You know everything. Uh, when we went to prison, I got to keep a lot of my notes. But as the years went by, the rules got stricter. Uh, and even though I wasn't 
part of the problem, and the problem, according to the prison system, was that they had too many women keeping too much stuff. Uh And I know one guy, one uh, associate warden told us, you know, if you can keep it in the locker, you can have it. And I know I could, but there were a lot of women who didn't care, and they had stuff all over their rooms. And uh, so they said no. So they started restricting everything we had. And uh, a woman who I spent a lot of time with, Helen Woodson, she uh, uh, was a peace activist. Uh, she, she's a remarkable person. And uh, she helped me. Uh, typed everything out on two sides of pages. They told us we could have 25 pieces of paper, uh, meaning letters. Sure. Uh, you know, that kind of thing. So we constantly were shifting and adjusting to accommodate the their restrictions. New yeah. That must have been kind of. Uh, uh, taxing at times because I'm sure like if you're like me when you're writing or and stuff is flowing out of you and you're remembering something you want to keep going (laughs) you know exactly exactly but it's not just that I had writings from uh and they're in the book a lot of them from uh five or six different people uh and I had to keep those, but I couldn't keep them as letters. So I had to retype them all. Uh, it was challenging. Wow. And I sent out a, a big packet of letters one time, a big packet of information and writings. I wrote a whole long piece about living on the corner in Los Angeles. It was... It was interesting. I mean, I know I was interested living there. We lived on the street corner. Anyway, uh, the what I got back was a plastic bag and a, a piece of the envelope. And the post office said, this is all we were able to find. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah, they said they lost it all. Uh, it wasn't their fault. It was that it wasn't uh, secured properly. We had to send out our mail uh, open, Uh, and we had, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. Well, uh, I will say it's been a real honor uh, to talk with you, and, um, you know, it's always a pleasure to talk to you because we have a lot in common philosophically, and it's really cool that you chose our show to come on, and we understand that you've been offered, you know, large amounts of money to go on, like, the... I won't say bad words, but the media, which you really can't trust. And we really understand that's probably a big decision on your part. So thank you so much for, you know, talking with us. So I really appreciate it. Much gratitude for that. Okay. Sorry I was so long-winded. Oh, are you kidding? I love listening to you talk. There's no sorry. It's okay. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Um, All right. Talk to you another time. Okay. Thank you. Lynette Fromey, we uh, send you our blessings and thanks once again for your time. Ladies and gentlemen, that does conclude our interview, and we hope you enjoyed that little interview. That was actually the longest interview we've ever done in our history, Sister Tracy. Well, you know, and uh, I, I think it is important to um, you know, allow her to to just kind of to flow. Yeah. You know what I mean? Uh, so many times we have guests on the show, not so many times, but once in a while we have a guest that you have trouble uh, getting a word out of. <laughs> oh no, man! I I really you have to coax them, and I really, you know, and I think you too. You need to talk into the mic. I cannot hear you on the. Air. I am right here, but um, I, but I think it's important that um, you know when guests like that that have something to set straight are allowed to do that. So well, know. the thing about talking, it's a conversation, and an interview to me, it shouldn't be like here's question number one, and now here's the answer. It should be a flow where. 
sometimes the next question is based on the last answer. And with um, Lynette, it's awesome. It's a pleasure to have a conversation with somebody. Instead of talking uh, at them, I'm talking with them. You know what I'm saying? Exactly. Yes, I do. It's awesome. Hey, how about a smoke break? 